Okay, my clock says 6.30. And so we're going to go ahead and convene this meeting of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District's Board of Directors for October the 1st, 2000, 2020. Holly, would you like to call the roll, please? Director Ferris? Here. Director Falls? Here. Director Henry? Here. Director Moran? Here. President Swan? Here. Thank you, Holly. Uh, at this time, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Uh, staff has none. Okay. For opportunity for oral communications from anyone in the public who's participating in this board meeting and uh, who has something they care to share or say or comment on that is not included in tonight's agenda. So let's we go to the, uh, just, just go to the chat now. We've got a few attendees. Okay, anybody have anything they want to uh, say? Doesn't look like. Okay, moving on to unfinished business. Rick? Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Chair Swan. Uh, in your uh, agenda packet under unfinished business, you have the CZU uh, wildfire damage assessment report. That was a link. It was not printed out because of the size of uh, the document. Um, we have a, uh, a document in, in your packet tonight, the wildfire damage assessment report that was prepared by uh, Sandus uh, civil engineers uh, and, safe and surveying partners. Um, a little background on Sandus. Sandus came to uh, work for the district under contract just uh, as the fire um, was raging through uh, our watershed. We brought Sandus on to uh, assist the uh, district staff in field engineering, damage assessment, uh, plans and specifications for bidding, um, a, a whole host of engineering and, and survey uh, practices. So they've been working side by side with district staff, um, preparing uh, engineering reports, uh, in which a lot of these reports and documentation will be used as part of the, the FEMA process to uh, put in for FEMA grants. Uh, they've been very valuable through. I just wanted to give you a little background on Sandus. Um, we do have uh, a report in there, and this is pretty current. Um, as of uh, last Friday, as agenda went out of where we are, the status of the water system um, from where we were uh, before the be at the beginning of the fire, you know, we're slowly uh, getting uh, regaining our storage. Um, we do have uh, all of our customers back in water. And I do believe we have a little over 300 customers uh, still in a do not drink, uh, do not boil area, which we'll talk a little more under underwater quality. Um, we uh, are moving on um, replacing the piping between the three large reservoirs, Big Steel, uh, Lion, Little Lion, uh, Sandus has, has put together uh, plan specifications for that project. Um, the uh, area has been cleared of the dangerous trees uh, on that site that were damaged by fire. And we are starting uh, construction of replacing that piping. That piping is being replaced. It was HDPE, it is being replaced uh, in ductile iron uh, ductile iron pipe DIP and is being buried. It was above ground. It is probably our most, one of our most critical sites. Uh, the district, uh, we did not want to go back in with above ground HDP and then have to come back. So we're moving uh, with installing uh, permanent repairs uh, with ductile iron and burying uh, that pipe. Uh, we're also uh, have put in temporary storage uh, throughout the Boulder Creek area have been completed. Uh, to several of our pressure zones that had uh, tanks damaged. Uh, just recently, uh, within the last couple of weeks, we uh, determined that our two biggest storage or, or two of our storage, our biggest storage, Lion and Little Lion tanks were contaminated uh, due to burning HDPE. The tanks themselves were not damaged. However, the burning HDPE pipe that was going between those three reservoirs acted as a chimney uh, so to speak, and pulled all the, the soot, debris, ash, 
right up into the tanks, actually coating the inside of the little lion tank and uh, coating a lot of uh, uh, lion tank, which isn't as bad. Uh, to date, uh, the operations crews have been working with outside contractors uh, and uh, Sandus on trying to pressure wash clean at first to see if we can remove that. Um, last I heard, it doesn't appear pressure washing is removing it. We've done some sampling and most likely we will be moving in the direction of having to recoat those two tanks. So that will significantly slow down getting uh, the Lion and Little Lion tank back online. Uh, as of, I do believe, yesterday, um, we uh, were able to put Big Steel tank back online, which wasn't damaged painting and coatings, but we went in and pressure washed and cleaned. Um, that's a, about, I think it's a million, 1.5 million gallon storage. So that's a huge storage increase in the town of Boulder Creek. Um, I, I can't speak enough on, on uh, how important that was to get back in service. It brings a lot of fire flow back into the Boulder Creek area and actually most of all of Boulder Creek because that supplies as far as far north, out Bear Creek Road, all the way to the end of system. Um, it's a big zone in our service area. So that was a, a milestone yesterday, being able to put that reservoir back in, back in, uh, back in line. Uh, we're moving ahead on continuing on the piping there between the three reservoirs. We're also moving ahead with replacing the Foreman Creek pipeline at this time. And you'll look as you see uh, through the, uh, the Sandus reports, you see some pretty good pictures of uh, the temporary construction up at uh, the Lion. You see some photos inside the tank. It takes a little bit to get oriented, but if you look, the, the coatings inside the Lion and Little Lion should be white. And as you can see, they're not white, and that black that you see is the byproducts of the HTP pipe burning. And that is pretty well adhered to the coatings. Um, as we're trying to get it off with pressure washing, we use much more pressure and the pressure washing will be taking the coatings off. So most likely we'll be moving ahead with a, a bid spec to go to a very quick turnaround bidding process to recoat uh, those two tanks. Um, with that, I, I probably left some stuff out because there is a, a large amount of work going on right now. Um, and uh, I'll ask if the director of operations uh, would like to add to any of that. James? Yeah, I got nothing to add. Nothing to add? Okay. With that then, uh, if you have any questions, uh, we'll try to answer them. Uh, there is a lot going on out there, um, trying to get uh, preparation, in preparation for winter storms to move into the, the potential for debris flows um, and trying to uh, move ahead and getting the, uh, the do not drink uh, orders lifted. Okay, thank you, Rob. Uh, board, do you have any questions or comments for uh, Lois? I see you found the raise your hand button. Congratulations. I did. I'm getting so smart. You're, you're, you got a cheat sheet. Well, I, since you brought up debris flows, I, I was wondering about, I've heard um, comments about maybe there's some way to catch the debris or uh, to stop it, but I'm wondering if if that would create a bottleneck if you put something to catch the debris that might be going down. Would it would it flood things or would it just uh, pile up branches? And I, I was just wondering if there's really a way that something could be done to stop all that debris. Well, Lois, to answer, to answer your question, you know, I, I'm not a, a civil engineer. However, we are working with Sandus, our civil engineers, and we are working with our fire management group who also have a lot of experience in debris flows and in, you know, um, in fire management. We're still looking at that. We've had meetings this week. We've had meetings with the county this week. We're having another meeting tomorrow to discuss if what and if we can do, you know, I don't know about stop, but you know, slow down velocities, maintain uh, certain areas, uh, harden our facilities. So I really can't answer your question, but we are looking at that. There's a lot of different theories out there. 
you know, I we have a short window of time uh, and not sure um, if uh, a lot of that work would be covered by FEMA or the county or would come directly from district. So we still have a lot of questions to be answered is, is the, the short answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bob, question? Yes, thanks. Yeah, and that was uh, definitely something we probably want to bring back to future board meetings as you um, as you find that out, Rick, because that is going to be a serious issue, I think, for us. A um, couple of questions about the financial page that you had in the agenda packet. Um, of the projects that are here, uh, which ones would be considered permanent versus temporary? Um, and of the coming on to $2 million, um, is that coming out of the reserves and how much of that is recoverable from FEMA and or the state? It, first off, I think that's item B. I'm gonna to refer to council. Oh, it is, sorry. I mean, they kind of, it all kinds of goes together, but I have a separate item to speak. Item 4B is the emergency contract status. Oh, sorry. Okay. I, I, Never mind. I, Never mind. I'll I have no problem off. answering it, but I just want to be sure that council doesn't have a. Yeah. No, no, we'll hold off. We'll hold, hold off on it then. Okay. And, and to answer the first part of your question, though, uh, Bob, if what we find out, you know, we're having a pretty high level meeting tomorrow, and if it looks like there's an action we can move ahead and take, uh, I do believe I would bring that back to the board to, with an emergency meeting ASAP, just because it will have a big price tag, most likely, and we should discuss moving ahead on that. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Any other uh, questions from the board? Any of the uh, attendees have any questions on this subject, the assessment report? Okay, Rick, you can go ahead and move on to item B. Right, item B is the, the CZU Lightning Fire Emergency Contract status update uh, and request for uh, additional funds uh, from the board. Uh, it's recommended that the board review the memo and authorize the district manager to amend construction contracts to facilitate damage repairs to the distribution system from the uh, CZU uh, Lightning Fire in the amount of $1,555,000. Uh, to date, the board has authorized the district manager to enter into construction contracts to facilitate water system damage repairs from the CZU Lightning Fire uh, in the amount of $550,000. Re repairs to date have centered on reestablishing water service and water quality to homes, installing temporary water tanks, installing temporary mains, main lines, uh, water quality sampling, and a large number of trees, approximately uh, 400 trees required removal uh, due to fire damage. And on those 400 trees, they were, I do believe, the majority of those trees were located in and around the Lion Facility Water Treatment Plant, the Lion Tank, the Little Lion Tank, and Big Steel Tank, and Big Steel Booster, all within reach of facilities or all a danger to staff uh, working and reinstalling facilities. A uh, registered professional forester was called in to evaluate trees, and those trees were marked uh, for removal by him. Uh, and those trees will also be tried to marketed to a, a local mill. Uh, additional construction work is needed in the process of replacing the, the Foreman Creek wall, raw water supply line, replacing all piping between the Lion, Little Lion and Big Steel tanks and a more additional water quality sampling. Uh, besides this work, uh, we're moving forward on cleaning uh, lion and little lion water storage tanks trying to remove uh, toxic uh, contamination. To continue those replacements and uh, repairs, the additional funds will be needed in the amount of 1.55 million. Um, to answer Director Fultz's earlier question, how much of this work or how much funds expense to date will be um, uh, re um, will be replaced by FEMA grants? The majority. Uh, there will be some items that are not eligible for grants, such as uh, regular labor costs. 
um, because uh, FEMA feels that they're you're paying regular labor no matter if you're you know out making repairs or doing normal weeks. Overtime uh, costs are eligible. Uh, possibly some of the food costs may not be reimbursable. Uh, the temporary labor is all reimbursable. And I do believe all of the other listed uh, on the back of that memo repairs uh, is eligible for FEMA uh, funding. To that, I'll, I'll try to answer any more questions. The bulk of this money, uh, you know, I have, I tried to break down and get as much backup as I could for the board. Uh, you'll see that the district is spending a, a large sum of money on uh, water quality testing. I think we figured that each one of those VOC samples is, is roughly uh, anywhere uh, between six and $800 a sample. They are uh, um, a, a very involved sample. You'll see there's temporary tanks in there. You'll see a lot of piping. You'll see construction work, construction contracts from Lewis and Tibbetts. Lewis and Tibbetts uh, are replacing all the pipeline in between uh, the three tanks that I talked about earlier. Lewis and Tibbetts also ran uh, some temporary main for us and Anderson for Civic, another contract that we pulled, contractor that we pulled from one of the pipeline projects also ran some above ground piping um, and the foreman line. The foreman line is probably one that you may have questions. Um, it's going back in right now as HDPE pipe. We are burying it as you've seen uh, uh, in uh, some of the photos, the construction photos that Sandus has took and provided to the board, that pipe is being buried between two and three feet. Um, if we put that pipe in temporary above ground, I'm afraid with debris flows uh, this year that we may lose it off the bench just because that whole area was completely burned out and most likely we will have several debris flows so the temporary would be damaged. So we are uh, in reinstalling that pipe buried and a two to three feet of cover, that pipe will be fine if uh, we were to have another fire in that area, it will be protected. Um, HDPE pipe is a great product. Um, some may question, should we use it or not? But for these applications of, for the raw water supply lines and to follow the contours of the mountains, you, know, you don't have straight roads, you don't have 90 degree turns, you have a, a, a very snake pipeline, HDPE is a, is a great product. It's very resilient. It, uh, it does not break easy. It does not damage easy. But yes, it is damaged by fire. But by burying this pipe, the entire lane will, will be protected by fire. Uh, and with that, if I can answer any questions or if the Director of Operations wants to add anything to uh, this report, um, more than happy to take questions. Just a question: What what percentage of the nine hundred thousand for the Foreman Creek line is a, re, a result of burying it versus the, the pipe? Um, I don't I don't have it broke down like that, Steve. Um, you know, the pipe itself was thirty thousand uh, dollars. The the dozer work is is probably comparable to that, if not more. Uh, and, and the fittings came in, you know, at another I think twenty eight thousand. I I can get you a breakdown. Uh, that that pipeline, we selected that to go back in right away because it's the shortest possible pipeline. We believe that we could bury it, um, that the it did have pipe supports and it, and it was a narrow trail, but we did go in and enhance the pipe bench. Uh, we were successful in completing a pipe bench from point A to point B, and now we're burying um, so, uh, and the reason we went with that first right now, and instead of waiting was that we can start bringing surface water in as soon as we determine that surface water is potable. Uh, it may take, you know, months of, uh, through the winter because of turbidity you know, we're anticipating the first few months of rainfall. Most likely we would not be able to take any water out of our surface sources just because of uh, all the debris flows. And that's something that we'll be talking about tomorrow. But as soon as say the sun comes out and the stream's turbidity drops to an acceptable level, and hopefully our lion and little lion tanks are recoated, 
we will have uh, our curb or our, our, our um, lion water treatment facility back up and running. Again, you know, our system is a roughly 50-50 split, surface water, well water. This is the time of year we normally use our surface water going into it. You know, at the end of October, we start getting rainfall. This is the time of year we try to let our wells rest. Uh, it's very important that we continue to operate. But this year may be different just because of all the, of the debris flows. Okay, thank you, Rick. Uh, Bob, do you have a question? Comment? Yes, several. Um, Rick, on the on the Foreman Creek pipe that went in, my understanding is that we were putting in temporary pipe and that it would go in as a different strategy for uh, permanent replacement. Um, you know, I've been reading a little bit about what happened up in Paradise, even with buried plastic pipe. And, um, you know, while the situation may not be comparable, um, they did have um, situations where even buried pipe was contaminated due to the heating of the water. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a concern for me because, um, you know, my intention was that we would be putting, you know, some sort of metal pipe back in place. In, in addition to that, as the plastic pipe comes up and out of the ground, is that also going to be plastic or are you planning on putting uh, some metal uh, at that uh, point? Everything coming out of the ground is ductile steel coming off of that pipeline. All the plastic will be buried on that pipeline. So um, we understand you know the whole effect of putting metal pipe in, but like Rick said before, this is not an area to put metal pipe back in. It's very snaky. It would have been very expensive. To do so, I'm I'm still discussion, have to ask the question the, the about whether or not heating the water. water is going right. to discussion is is not over with yet on whether that pipe is temporary or permanent. We know from meeting with engineering and being out there a couple of things. One, if we would have just went in and put it above ground temporary, that was my first original intent to go out and just you know snake a new. 12-inch uh, HCPE line out there just to start bringing water in. That was our, our first intention. And then when we started uh, looking in the, the different uh, soils folks and the, from the county, erosion, um, all the, uh, the different people looking at the soils, it was evident that those soils were going to start sliding down the hill onto the bench. And if, it, if you have the pipe covered, it'll go, it should go right over those loose first foot of soil, loose soil and ash that's coming down, trees, so forth, it's just sliding down the hill, it should go right over. It was determined that the loose pipe laying on top of the ground would be severely damaged, or temporary would be severely damaged. So we said, hey, can we dig and bury, it's decomposed granite. We talked, yes, we can dig and bury. So we could still address, because we have to address this with the five mile and pea vine, these other ones where we can't just go in and, and easily bury like we did on uh, Foreman. So we will address with FEMA to see if they'll mitigate. I don't know if they will. We can address that and see if we can change pipe type. Uh, we're definitely going to do, that will be a discussion on the, uh, on the five mile and on the P mine pipe because right now to go in and do, to bury along those pipelines, is a pretty substantial project. And most likely it's gonna, you're gonna find that the type of pipe, if you can bury along five mile, is gonna be HDPE. HDPE is a really good product if we put it in correctly. Um, and then there's other things we can do as well to protect that pipe. We can go in and, as PG&E does and keep a 150 foot um, <laughs> center line of all trees and vegetation removed. There's things we can do, and that becomes costly as well, to keep the, the fuel load off of that pipe. I would not recommend putting HDPE above ground anywhere anymore. Uh, I, I strongly not recommend that. But we may get to a process with FEMA that instead of maybe seven to 10 million, you're looking at you know 25 million to put that in, and they may not cover that. It's a discussion we're gonna have with them 
but we haven't got that far yet. And um, I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable with Foreman the way it is right now. In in the case of um, Paradise, where the pipe was buried, I think three feet or so, it still um, got hot and still introduced VOCs into the into the system. At that level, you're you know you really don't even know that that's happening until it, it goes. So, your what I'm hearing is your plan on avoiding that is given that again this is kind of a change from what I thought we had, had voted on is to just make sure we keep fire lines on either side of the pipe so that the ground will never heat up um, to that point where it would introduce VOCs into the system. That's correct. And you know it when when the fire did come down to uh, our raw water supply lines, we saw it coming and we did isolate um, those pipelines so nothing would get in the treatment plant. Um, in Paradise, we had a long discussion with the Paradise Irrigation District and what got into their pipe was steam from, from the hot water. It was a, a super hot fire, steam got in and destroyed the, the pipe from the inside out. And at first they did not know about that. You know, in each fire, we're, we're learning more. But as James said, the uh, ends of the pipeline will be in ductile iron and be up at the intake will be underwater in the stream. And the other end going into the treatment plant will be four to six feet. It, it dives down as it goes into the treatment plant. And so and we have an engineer. We have an engineer that is. We have an engineer that said this is buried deep enough in order yes. to avoid. Yes, we do. Uh, we still have to have this discussion on the other supply lines because burying them, this was relatively easy to do, and that's why it was done. Second uh, question on the um, list of projects, then, which one of these would be considered permanent and which one would be considered, well, I guess just which one's a permanent because then the rest are, by definition, temporary. Right. I, I would say, well, I, 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 I do say the piping between Lion, uh, Little Lion. Is that uh, Lion Tank Plumbing? Is, is permanent plumbing. It's, okay. it's, it's, it's changed from HDPE above ground to ductile iron pipe below ground. Just okay, changing it to ductile iron pipe wouldn't work because James and, and uh, the engineering firm did uh, research and the gaskets would melt and cause the same problems as the HDPE pipe. So right. you've got it, you've got to bury it. So all of that work is considered permanent. Okay. So the Lion Tank plumbing and the Foreman Creek plumbing, uh, Foreman Creek raw water and intake are, are two that we could consider permanent at this right. point. Right. And then there's there's parts of some of these other projects like Blackstone and Eckley. We replaced the tank. Parts of those are going to be considered permanent. Okay. Uh, as well, well. big steel, big steel, and little line are also in on that piping. Right. In all three of those tanks. Um, and then what's the what's the balance left in our reserves right now? Given both operating increase, I'm assuming we're down revenue, up operating, and we're taking in the capital here as well. That's, that's our correct. reserve level. I'm not sure if Stephanie is on the call or not tonight. No, okay, so we had going into this uh, three million in reserves, so we're going to be down roughly around two million. And Stephanie and I have talked that we believe that we should be calling a uh, a finance committee meeting and start running some hard numbers and talking. She has several plans. You know, once we get the FEMA grants approved, uh, we can do bridge loans, um, and there's other other. Uh, discussion she's had with other financial institutes about bridge loans as well. So that would be a special finance committee since we right, canceled that'd be a special the finance committee meeting. That's correct. All right. Thank you. Lois, you have your hand up again. Yes, I do. So FEMA pays uh, about 75%, but that's not all federal. Part of that is state, right? Well, there's some additional that we can get and we're, we're trying to define those numbers. We had our first FEMA kickoff meeting uh, the beginning of the week. Uh, there's other percentages that we can get from the state of California um, and additional, hopefully additional FEMA monies. Uh, state of California is an additional finance state. 
Um, so there is a potential that we can do better than the 75%. Yeah, with the help of the state, right? With the help of the state, that's correct. Yeah, what does the state normally, I forget what that's called, that part of FEMA, or it's- uh, OES. OES. OES, yes. <laughs> So what is that normally? How much is that normally? I think that can be as much as 11%, anywhere from 11 to 15%, if I got my numbers right from uh, the webinar. And on top of 75? 75. Okay. So- uh, That would be hard to get though. Well, come on. They, we need to try to get it. Well, I, I don't say we won't try to get it, but I don't want to say it's a, pure, a sure thing. No, I, I know nothing is a sure and thing. Tomorrow with, is an now, even sure And thing. there's also another side to this that I, I uh, there's also uh, the district is insured. We have uh, insurance for uh, contamination, um, pollution. Uh, they will pick up areas that FEMA will not, it's my understanding. Now we haven't got it in writing yet, but from our verbal meeting that we had with SDRMA, their adjusters, uh, district council and myself, they will pick up regular salary responding to this uh, event. So there's funds that they will pick up that FEMA will not. And there's also uh, funds that, uh, SDR, uh, that FEMA will not pay and let SDRMA, SDRMA pay. So, so back and forth. If dollars. something's insured, we will not be able to get FEMA reimbursement or FEMA grants for. Okay. So if if um, the insurance pays, do they have a big deductible or is there a deductible only for lawsuits? Uh, I can't answer that. Gina, have you looked at that? I know I think it's a twenty five thousand dollar deductible on no property. No matter loss. what. I'm pretty sure it is on property loss. Mm -hmm. um, we have a number of potential coverages in play and the deductible varies depending on what the coverage is, but um, yeah. I, I could be wrong, Rick. I haven't seen anything uh, in the FEMA documentation that indicates that um, deductible amounts couldn't be covered if the repair exceeds insurance coverage. Have you? I, I have not. And they didn't really address the insurance coverage on the webinar that closely but they do have contacts on that. Um, and when they come down and they do the one-on-one, -on -one, you know, the state and the feds come down and meet with the district and go over, you know, our grant requests, um, that will, will be discussed. Because they have uh, requested our insurance documents, our policy, and we, we have provided that to them. Okay, so I agree we should have a budget and finance committee meeting at some point. We also, I mean, we agree too. I mean, uh, we think that should be sooner than later. Absolutely. Because I want to leave town later. See if I have my hand up, if Lois is done. Oh. I'm ahead. done. Yes, sir, Rick Moran. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to add on to what Bob and Rick were talking about here. And so quick question, Rick, is, is there any uh, flammable material left around where these pipes are gonna go, particularly on Foreman? Have we burnt everything? So have we created defensible space? Not yet. We have not created defense. There are still a probably a large amount of uh, trees that need to come down. And FEMA covers debris removal um, when it's in reach of a facility. So anything in with reach in, in reach that could damage a facility or injure staff um, is covered by FEMA for removal. So in a sense, it hasn't really got off of you know our our sites, our facilities, the, the Lion area and the the Foreman pipeline in, in the early uh, or in the the front footage areas leaving the treatment plant. We haven't really got out, and there's a, a you know a lot of trees to still be removed. Um, but the, the plan is to remove them. The plan is to remove them or to have a forester come in and either say, you know, fall and leave in place, remove. We haven't quite tackled that end of it yet because some of these, more, I don't, some of these, the redwood would be marketable. Um, so we ought to have recovered, you know, any costs or any, any funds that we can from damaged trees. 
Well, what I'm suggesting is that in, in a sense, we've created defensible space around these pipes by these trees burning. Is, is that, that be, they, but they still need to be removed. We still need to clean. Okay. Yes. And, and as far as the removal, part of the, um, the debris flow and stuff like that is sometimes leaving those trees uh, laying on the ground is a part of uh, debris flow that's mitigation. Correct. Okay. That's correct. Um, so I, I agree with all the, the talk that's going on about the, the dangers and the, the pluses for um, the HDP E piping. Uh, I just want to make sure we, we touch on this because a, a lot of people were critical of, or some people were critical of finding that out when our pipe burned. Um, I so I, I want to be thorough and make sure that we uh, we go through this. Um, nothing is 100% savable in a catastrophic fire, but we got to do as best we can. And I think creating a defensible space around a buried pipeline is puts us in a different category than what maybe happened in paradise. Maybe trees were around there and now we have an opportunity to keep that fuel load, as you called it, Rick, away from there. So I, I think as, as long as we keep the fuel load away from these HDPE piping, that we're doing a better job than um, in the past. So uh, in that regard, I, I, I support you going ahead and doing this at the foreman site. Thank you, Rick. Any other questions? I see Bob, I see you're there. Bob, go ahead. Yes, thanks. Um, so Rick, I understand your point, um, but it, it's not just as simple as, as taking down trees, I don't think. Um, one of the things that I think at least I learned um, about this fire is that the stumps actually themselves are um, as much of a issue as, as a tree itself, uh, particularly as it goes down into the ground. I think I was, you heard somebody say that there's, there's some stumps up there that, that are going down, you know, many feet into the ground. And if those stumps are next to the pipe, um, that, that's an issue. And, and so, I, you know, this is why I think there needs to be a much broader conversation about what we're going to do for permanent versus temporary. Um, I certainly understand the, the urgency to get water down to our treatment plant as, as quickly as we can, um, but, but I think this is a, a bigger issue for us and certainly for the community as we try to make sure that, um, you know, these sorts of things don't happen again. And just because it's burned through that area once doesn't mean that it can't burn through it again. Um, at, at some point here in the in the near future, so I, I'm I have to admit I'm I'm still a little concerned that that we um, are going to have to address this head on. I do, I don't from my point of view I don't know that Foreman is a permanent solution at this point. Okay, and I, I do believe and James correct me I think we we did remove the stumps along the new Foreman pipeline when they went in. We took a dozer in there and, and removed. Uh, yeah, the stumps, the stumps along the pipeline were removed. Yeah. The stumps between the tanks were not removed. That's correct. And how, how far from the pipeline does it need to be removed? Uh, well, we got a, our dozer line is about, the road, it's roughly about 12 feet on average going all the way through. And then the upper stumps, obviously they carved in a little bit further on the upper side where there was a stump and pulled it down off there. So, I mean, the trail itself is pretty safe at this point. It's it's the fire line that I'm concerned about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, it looks really good up there. And it, I mean, there's a lot of trees still, dead trees around it, but burying it, I think it's going to be protected from all that and falling down and stuff. So I think we're pretty good in that regard. Now, and I bought the, the five mile and P vine, uh, about almost seven miles of pipe that we have outstanding to replace. That discussion needs to happen and will start to happen soon. I, I just think we should be including Foreman in it as well yeah. because yeah. any any yeah. remediation we do on any of those, if, if plastic were to be used, um, we still have the same concerns as with Foreman. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Any other uh, questions or comments from any of the directors? If not, we'll go to the... Uh, 
<clears throat> and uh, who has their hands up? Uh, first up, Joe Cucciera. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I certainly understand and uh, laud the uh, temporary emergency repairs that are being made. I. I share some of the other board members' comments, um, concerns. Has the district commissioned from the, their engineers a dedicated engineering cost-benefit analysis for what is the best permanent solution for replacing the lines that were destroyed in the fire? I asked that question because it would be not only useful for the district in deciding what kind of permanent repairs they want to make, but it would go a long way in discussions with the state, FEMA, and the governor and federal administration to argue why we need additional support to do a better job so that we don't keep repeating this problem. And that is something that the federal government typically is responsive to. Uh, a good analogy is in flood zones, if you can come up with a mitigation me measure that is gonna be less costly in the long run, such as relocations, uh, even though it may cost more initially up front, when you look at the long-term cost and benefits, it oftentimes makes sense to spend more up front. So that's one part of my inquiry. The second is, has there been any progress with regard to getting the state to request 100% financing from FEMA, from the federal government for the district's repair cost. Um, because this is more than just the state helping you bank the 25% local share. The federal government has the ability to pay 100%. It has to be requested it has to be justified and it has to come from the state, but it also has to come from the federal representatives for the county as a whole and specifically for the district. And it's, it's one thing to ask, you know, to go with handout to the state and say, please help us with the local share it's in the state's interest to get 100% financing or as close to it as possible from the federal government. And my third point, which I, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not trying to sound like a broken record. That's not my Joe, intent. Joe, gonna, Joe, you're running out of time. We're, we got a, a five minute limit. Let's, let's get some answers minutes, to the first President. question before we get to your third question. I didn't hear the last thing you said. Does anybody want to address Joe's initial question? Well, uh, some, first off, on the cost, you guys want to on, cost, Joe's first on, on, the, on, on his first question, the cost benefit analysis, we are uh, collecting information right now to move in that direction. We've had uh, James has been out with contractors that do. Uh, work in this type of area, do hard to install to try to get different type of uh, construction techniques um, to start looking at that cost benefit uh, analysis. We will be doing that. that. That's a must in moving forward on uh, our raw water supply lines. On our pipelines that, you know, all contamination that we had, uh, to my knowledge, not unless staff can tell me different, was from, uh, most of it was from customer service lines from the meter to the house. And there may have been some, uh, and there was some from uh, the HDPE above ground between the tanks. None of the uh, contamination came from 
the raw water supply lines, as they were all shut down, I do believe at least two days before fire uh, reached them. Um, so what we're doing now, uh, we feel comfortable that replacing the, the piping between the, the reservoirs in ductile and burying, um, and we're out actually sampling service lines out in the distribution system that are HDPE, that we're finding that contamination is coming from the home back into the, the service line. So there's a, there is a, a lot to this. We will be working, we're just getting FEMA, is just starting to set up assessments and just starting to talk with FEMA and talking with Bruce McPherson. And he's been talking with our, our state uh, legislators uh, on additional funding. Everybody's open to talk. We're just we're just getting there. You know, the fire was just in containment here what, last week, and we're moving now into the into the recovery phase. And I <coughs> I didn't hear Joe's third question. Go ahead, Joe. Um, has there been any discussion started about getting an Army Corps of Engineers project assistance for the permanent project? For the permanent permanent replacement project, not at this time. We we haven't even got approval on the permanent replacement project yet. I I raise that because it can save engineering costs for the district, and mm -hmm. the Army Corps is also capable of actually doing the construction project that is then paid for by the federal government. Is, is that it, Joe? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Beth, you had your hand up for a while there. I don't want to uh, take you out. Please go ahead. You're on mute, Beth. Hi, Steve. Thank you. Um, some of some of what I was going to address has already been addressed, but one thing I think would be really helpful uh, once some of this gets figured out, because the HDPE pipe line was very controversial in terms of you know the the conversation in the community, and I know it's a much more complicated story why it was there and and what you know what the decisions were that that caused it to be there um, and why and how we're going to replace it and why it would be really nice if some kind of a concise communication about that once you get to that place is made to the community because I think it will relieve some people to know that there are some good reasons for how it was done it wasn't some horrendous mistake and that there are plans made now to mitigate um, possible damage upcoming uh, from what we've learned. That's all, thanks. Thank you, Beth. Um, okay. That's a good idea about the communication side of it. I, don't, I assume, Rick, do you have any comments on that? Well, uh, no, we will do a, a you know a cost benefit analysis. Uh, you know, I, I don't believe at the time when we selected HEP pipe, it would have been the difference of, you know, the environmental impact of doing something different of, you know, cutting trees down. Uh, it, it wouldn't have been acceptable at the time. Uh, I'm not even sure of it's gonna be acceptable at the time now, except a lot of the trees are damaged and we may have to go in and remove those trees anyhow. Um, and to, to actually excavate, you know, seven miles across the Ben Lomond mountain, there was a lot of environmental concerns. A lot of erosion concerns. There was, you know, it was all looked at at the time. And HDPE, yes, they knew it. That we knew at the time that you know that fire could damage the pipe. That was probably the only, you know, mudslides, trees falling on it, you name it. It was pretty much instructable. The one thing that it did uh, have impact on it was fire, and we knew that going in. Um, and that's about what I can say. We'll do, you know, we'll do a, you know, a, a cost benefit analysis and, and engineering work on it. And we may wind up 
back with this same solution and have to make a decision or not. You know, it's going to be cost and it's going to be environmental impact. And so, we have had things happen like trees fall and oh, yeah. earth move on that pipeline, but it's very was very easy to go in and fix. Yeah, or a lot of times it just put, pulled off the bench and you drain the pipe and you come along come along the pipe back up on the bench. It a very resilient pipe. Um, and it snakes. It's a welded pipe that is flexible. It snakes through the contours of, uh, of the mountain where metal pipe, either be welded fittings or ductile iron pipe, you couldn't leave it above ground. You would have the rubber gaskets and the amount of fittings in these 18 foot rigid lengths, you would have a one heck of a cut in the embankment to, uh, to lay that pipeline out. Um, but that'll all come out. I mean, it needs to be looked at, not just me sitting here and telling you that. We need to have it well engineered, uh, cost benefit analysis, have discussion at board level. Um, we don't have a lot of time to, uh, you know, FEMA has time limits, but we can ask for extensions and we can do this at the same time we're doing environmental review. Environmental review for replacement of these pipelines um, during the non-emergency time, it, it'll be extremely lengthy. There'll be a lot of discussion. You will have people right down telling us that maybe we shouldn't be, even be taking the water uh, at these locations and maybe picking it up somewhere else. There's going to be a lot of discussion on replacing these pipelines. Thank you, Rick. Are there any other questions from the uh, attendees, public? Back to the uh, back to the board agents. A request for a motion uh, to to uh, authorize the district manager to amend the construction contracts uh, to increase them up to one point five 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 million dollars. Is that correct? Correct. Right. Okay. Um, uh, can I? Um, I think a correction needs to be made. I think that's by one point five five million dollars to a total of. Two million and change. All right. Thank you. I mean, uh, what's your name, counselor? <laughs> <laughs> Gina, sorry, Gina. I'm getting crazy. Rick, you have a. Uh, your uh, so I'll, I'll make that motion to authorize the district manager to amend construction contracts to facilitate damage repairs to the distribution system from the CZU lightning fire for $1,555,000. I'll second that motion. In, in addition to the already half a million dollars he's been offering. Yes. Yeah, right. Okay. In addition. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. We have, uh, and Lou just seconded that. Okay. We've got some more hands up here. Lois, did you have a comment or? No, I was going to second it, but oh, okay. Lou did. So. Beat you to the punch. Okay. Great. So, Holly, would you like to go ahead and record the vote? Director Ferris? Aye. Director Falls? Yes. Director Henry? Yes. Director Moran? Yes. President Swan? Yes. Okay. Rick. That motion passes. Thank you, Paul. Rick, that, our, that our next item uh, 4C is an update uh, on the CZU wildfire water quality of, of the district. Um, I've also asked uh, our water treatment and system supervisor, uh, Nate Gillespie, to uh, join the meeting tonight uh, as we go through this memo to help answer questions. This becomes uh, uh, very uh, scientific at times, and uh, Nate's uh, knowledge uh, is very valuable. Um, uh, it's recommended the board review this memo in regards to the wildfire water quality update during the uh, lightning uh, complex fire that started on uh, 816, high density polyethylene HCPE mains in the direct line of the fire were damaged and melted. Uh, the that resulted in uh, depressurizing of the water distribution system. Immediately after the discovery, the, the district contacted its regulatory agency, the State Water Resource Control Board, who recommended issuing a, a precautionary do not drink, do not boil. Uh, notice to all affected residents in the uh, depressurized zone. I think early on, and James, you can correct me, I think that was around 3,000 customers. 
uh, in the beginning. Uh, in preparation uh, for, the, uh, for the fire, the district was able to isolate several areas of the distribution system uh, before some of the HPPE pipes uh, uh, were destroyed. Uh, volatile organic compounds, VOCs, are a possible contaminant of the depressurization zone due to the, uh, the melting of the HDPE. Uh, before the issuance of the uh, do not drink, do not boil order, the district collected water quality samples for VOCs, volatile organic chemicals. Uh, They're a possible contaminant uh, from the depressurization uh, and the melting of the HDPE mains. All VOC samples collected were analyzed under uh, EPA method 524.2, which includes a screen of 84 different VOCs uh, included in the EPA method uh, 524.2 are trihalomethanes, which are disinfectant byproducts. Uh, trihalomethanes are commonly found in public water systems uh, that use chlorine uh, for disinfectant and were found in all samples collected by the, the district. Uh, trihalomethanes include uh, chloroform, uh, bromo, bromoform, uh, chlorobiomethane and dichloromethane or methylene. Uh, I knew I was going to butcher those. I told Nate I would have a tough time with those. Uh, the health-based state standard maximum contaminant level MCL for the THMs is uh, 80 parts per billion. Uh, San Lorenzo Valley routinely monitors dist uh, distribution system for THMs uh, every quarter. In 2019, the detection range of THMs in the distribution system uh, was one to four, 40 parts per million, per billion. On uh, 9-8, 2020, the district learned that benzene was detected in a water sample taken uh, up on Creek Drive in the Riverside Grove neighborhood. The sample was taken uh, on 9-4, a part of uh, the Riverside Grove neighborhood, this part of the Riverside Grove neighborhood where the samples uh, are, have been taken are still under a do not drink, do not boil advisory. Uh, the Riverside Grove neighborhood was heavily impacted by the C, uh, CZU lightning complex fire. Evidence from the wildfire suggests that benzene contaminants likely to occur where structures uh, were damaged by the fire. The district found uh, that none of our distribution system was damaged by fire. It was uh, a system that was put into good construction standards back in the day. Uh, all service lines and main lines uh, were buried underground at the proper depths. depths. Uh, when structures burned, the water system experienced low pressure. Plastic particle, particles, gases, and other fire-related contamination can be drawn into the water system uh, and through the connections and may get past the meter into the public water system. Currently, the, the district is sampling several of these laterals to structures that were damaged by fire or VOCs in the Riverside Grove neighborhood. Uh, these samples are collected after the water has been uh, stagnating in the service line, service laterals for 72 hours. That's the, it's not the minimum, but the district um, uh, decided that longer was better. I do believe, Nate, what the minimum is 48 hours, and we wanted to go to 72 hours to be sure. To date, water has been restored to most of the district customers, while 333 customers remain on the do not drink, uh, do not boil advisory. Uh, these 333 customers are mostly located uh, west of uh, Highway 236, the Payone Drive intersection, uh, West Park Avenue, uh, and in the Riverside Grove area. The district will be sampling uh, these areas for VOCs uh, on the week of 928 and we'll post lab results on the website as soon as feasible. It takes us about a week after the sample is collected to ship it out, have 24 hour analysis, receive analysis back, have uh, the state review, have district staff review and, and uh, get it posted. So it takes about a week to get the, this information out to the public. Um, the district will also be continuing with sampling service laterals to burn structures, and the district continues to monitor for VOCs uh, via the EPA method 524.2 throughout the areas affected by the uh, do not drink, uh, uh, do not boil notice. And correct me if I'm wrong, Nate, we're also collecting samples in areas still that were not impacted by fire. 
Yeah, that's correct, Rick. And uh, just to add on to that too, we're also in the process of coming up with a long-term monitoring plan with the State Water Resources Control Board. Uh, we're currently drafting that plan to, uh, again, just continue to monitor for VOCs for their, uh, the long-term in it, uh, the affected areas as well as the areas that were not affected. So with that, um, if Nate, if you don't have anything else to offer, um, I'll turn it back to the chair for questions. Thank you, Rick. Um, Director Moran, you have your hand up. Rick, do you have a question? No. Um, so uh, now all our water is being filtered at the, treated at the Kirby plant. And I'm wondering how is it doing? Is it keeping up with that? Can it keep up with that? What's now that we're not using lions and how's the treatment process going? I guess to Nate. Yeah, so uh, some water is coming from the Kirby treatment plant only on an as needed basis. Um, right now, water is coming from the Quail Hollow wells as well as the Olympia wells. Um, only when we can't keep up with those wells are we sending water from the Kirby treatment plant to the uh, SLV system. Uh, but the Kirby water treatment plant is, uh, yeah, it's keeping up just fine right now. Um, we're not seeing any turbidity issues at this time. Um, uh, pH is a little bit higher than uh, we've seen in the past, but really that's the only uh, foreseeable or uh, only uh, remarkable um, uh, thing going on with the Kirby treatment plant. Is then my, uh, one other question would be, how are we communicating with those 333 people? I, I know we've been trying to be really good about that. I, just maybe if you could tell us how you're doing that, Rick. I'll let Nate, Nate's been communicating quite well, so I'll yeah. let I uh, Yeah, a, a lot of the customers are, they're calling me directly and uh, I've been uh, calling them back. I know we've also uh, posted a little bit on uh, uh, social media, um, what's going on um, out there that we were gonna be out in that area sampling this week. Right. We're also communicating with a lot of folks when they come in to get bottled water uh, our front office staff are answering a lot of questions. We're taking uh, bottled water out to some of the neighborhoods, the far reach neighborhood in Riverside Grove, especially so folks don't have to come all the way down into to Boulder Creek. Um, we're, we're receiving quite a few emails from people and you know, the most common question is, you know, how much longer? Uh, people seem to know uh, that uh, either they're in the do not drink you know, because we've actually went out to a lot of houses, uh, house to house with notices. Um, and we've had some little pocketed areas that we've been concerned on that, you know, several of the neighbors' homes burned, but there's still several homes in those neighborhoods. So those neighborhoods have been, they're lifted, uh, they're allowed to drink, but we're, very, we're monitoring those neighborhoods very closely just in case. And we're not finding any detects. Uh, and so we're trying to communicate as much as possible. Very good, thank you. Uh, Lou, I, you have your hand up. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I have a question for Nate. Nate, what is the standard practice when you're doing water quality testing and you find an excursion above the potable water limit? I assume that you probably do a uh, resample retest, but my, my real question is, what do you do when that retest is both uh, within potable limit and, or confirms that it is out? What, what's the action taken on those both, those two options? Uh, you know, it, it'd be kind of a case by case basis. We'd, we'd be reviewing that data with our regulatory agency and, uh, you know, taking a, into account the uh, hydrologic model of uh, the distribution system. Um, you know, really hard to, you know, give a, a hard and fast formula for it. it. It'd be more of a case by case. But uh, yeah, sampling and resampling and resampling, you know, in any any sites that do, uh, you know, show any remarkable data is certainly, you know, what we do. So when you say resampling, resampling, does that mean that you retest at least twice to get a preponderance of data? If you have a, a out of spec and then a retest in spec, to me, you still can't make a decision yet because you don't know which one's right and which one is wrong. So um, is, is there a standard practice to do at least uh, an additional retest for preponderance of data or is there some other standard practice? 
Uh, yeah, I, I'd say, yeah, multiple, multiple uh, sampling. Uh, you know, our, our sample that we detected uh, benzene in, in the Riverside Grove neighborhood, uh, that sample site has been sampled. Um, I, I don't even know how many times off the top of my head right now, but it's been sampled several times. So, um, yeah, we're, we're, you know, keeping an eye on any, any spots that are of concern and sampling them multiple times. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Lou. Lois? Yeah, Nate. Uh, is he there? Uh, is Eurofins doing most of your testing? Eurofins is doing all of our VOC testing. All of it, okay. And they're a worldwide... Uh, what do I want to say? Testing people, they have a really good reputation. They have a very good laboratory. Yes. Uh, we've been, uh, we've had a long standing relationship with Eurofins. They've got a, a, a very good program. They're ELAP certified um, and uh, they're, they're turning out samples quite, quite quick for us. Okay. Thank you. They're, ha they're able to handle a large volume where a lot of the, some of the other labs are not able to. Thank you, Lois. Bob, do you have a comment, a question? A question. Um, about how long do we expect the enhanced um, sampling and testing protocol to go into the future? Is it a year, two years, five years? What's the, uh, what expectation should we all have for that? Um, I, I'd say at this time, and again, we'll probably, we'll be hammering out these details with the State Water Resources Control Board, but I would think uh, roughly a, a two years. And not at this yeah, level, but like Nate, we'll be able to reduce the amount of samples that we take. I, once I was going to say, is that at the same volume of samples that we've been doing here recently? No, it would be a much reduced, uh, it would be more, you know, we need to identify the best sites that would be uh, uh, good, representa uh, good representation of our, our system um, uh, in our long-term plan. So yes, but, in, in the future, it would expect to ramp down quite a bit. Once we are out of the do not drink, do not boil notices, uh, I would expect testing to uh, significantly uh, ramped down. Uh, not to say we aren't going to still be testing, but the volume of testing will go down. And, but we and not only have... that, can I add to that, please? And not only that, but the samples will be cheaper once we get into the long-term monitoring plan because we'll have a longer extended, we're not getting 24-hour turnaround. That's why they're so expensive right now. And so we'll just go on standard turnaround and the cost is hugely different. And um, we would still retain, though, a focus on the neighborhoods that were most heavily impacted, which are really the ones that are still on the do not something um, standard right now. Is that correct? Yes. That's well, correct. well, not the Lion Zone is still on it right now because they were the last ones to get their temporary system in. It was a very hard temporary system to get into them. Um, all the temporary that we put in there was brand new. We aren't sure if that is contaminated yet. We haven't got results back for that zone. So it might not be that bad. It just it took an extended time to get that system back up and running. Yeah, but I'm, I'm focused on like the rivers, like, like the places that are right. currently in the do not whatever um, zones, Riverside Grove, et cetera. Those we would still retain an enhanced testing focus on, I, I, I'm assuming. Right, but I was just reverting back that little, the lion zone is still in that too, but it's not the same scenario as of yet. But Nate, we would still be focused, we would still maintain a good focus in those areas, correct? That's correct, yes. Great, thank you. Hey, Bob, any other comments or questions from any of our directors? If not, we'll go to the Call-in participants, anybody uh, on the attendee list or have a question or comment? Uh, Joe Gutierrez. Thank you, Mr. President. At the uh, September 7th Board of Directors meeting, I made some inquiries as well as some 
suggestions having to do with the water quality uh, sampling and reporting. And the response at the meeting was that uh, it was preferred to send me an email the following day, um, which would have been the 18th. I, I never received any response from the district. Um, I have some uh, continuing concerns. I'm not gonna restate what I did on the 17th. You've got that on your record. It'd be nice to get a response to it. Um, what is the uh, sampling rate at the various locations? How often are you sampling? Uh, so we, we've got uh, roughly uh, almost 60 sample locations we've sampled at to date, and uh, we've collected over 200 VOC samples. Um, sampling rate, uh, you know, it, it just really depends week to week. Um, this week we, you know, turned uh, or we sampled our, our uh, lion pressure zone. So, um, you know, uh, we, we took several samples out there this week. Um, it, it just really varies day to day. Because I, I know it's been represented that you're doing continuing sampling throughout the district. And if you look at like locations three, four, and five, they were last, at least what's what's posted on your summary table, they were last uh, sampled on either September 12th or September 18th. And I was wondering how frequently you're doing the sampling. Uh, again, yeah, it's a case by case uh, or a site by site. Um, uh, um, Side by side case. So, you know, uh, sites uh, two, three, and four, for example, did not have uh, any detections on them. We've kind of narrowed down into more uh, downstream representative sites of those. Um, and we're just kind of sampling, you know, in, uh, you know, our, our localized zones right now. So, is it possible on your maps? Uh, you've issued some nice maps with the various sample locations. Is it possible to show the outlines of the different zones within the district? Um, I, I suppose it would be possible, yes. Yeah, that's no problem, we could do that. that that'd, be really, that'd be really nice. That's an, that's an easy layer to add, we'll just ask Dan to come up. That, that, that would be really helpful. And uh, I notice you're, you're, you're showing the MCLs when you've got a detection like on the benzene or the VOCs, is it possible just at the top of the tables to show the MCLs for the various constituents that you're testing for? Um, I, know, I know they all don't have one, but the ones that do, mm -hmm. it would be good if, if there was just a, a standard showing of the MCLs for everything that you're testing and one place to put it so that you don't have to be redundant would be at, at the top where you are labeling what constituent you're testing for. If anything, I think a legend is what you're looking for. So you could do yeah. it like a legend as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we, we could, uh, we could add a legend. Definitely. Um, the, you know, I, I think uh, if, if I understood you, you were thinking maybe more like a column for each of the VOCs. Um, is is um, that what I understand or? I don't think well, we I take think it that I'm... far. I don't think we take it that far. We do it as a legend mm -hmm. at the top of the page for the MCL. And then from there, they can figure it out. Yeah, we, we can certainly do that. On, on all the different things you're testing for. Not, not just not just the benzenes and the VOCs, but all of the constituents. Mm -hmm. that, that would be very helpful. Is, is there any way to, to know when you will be testing some of these areas again, or is it is it a hit and miss? Uh, you know, it, it's just kind of a, a you know scheduled testing, I guess. Uh, you, you know, we're we're looking at what we haven't sampled lately, and uh, again, you know, we're focusing right now on the lion. Uh, pressure zone because we don't have any data there. So we're focusing our efforts yeah. on generating data in that zone right now. So, you know, yeah, it just really varies week to week. Once I we mean, get I, the long-term testing plan in place, that will be 
public information at that point. Yeah, no, I fully uh, appreciate that you've got hot spots and problem areas that you're keeping a closer eye on. Overall, as you know, for for the entire system, it's good to just check to see that part of the system hasn't leaked in some unknown way any of the contaminants into another one of the zones. Yeah, correct. Uh, and we actually did uh, we did a sampling uh, this uh, this last week that was kind of a repeat sampling of revisiting a lot of these uh, old locations. So probably by next week you'll see some more uh, lab results on you know some some of these sites revisited. Thank you very much, Nate. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Uh, okay, Danny. Any other questions from anybody? Uh, any of the uh, participants? No, okay. Bring it back to the uh, back to the board then. So we're not being asked to make any uh, take any action at this point, are we? I don't see one specifically. No, specific. it's just strictly informational to keep the board right. informed on our water quality. Okay, thanks, Rick. Then uh, in that case, we can move on to uh, 4D. All right, item uh, 4D uh, is the water bill adjustment policy proposed resolution. Uh, District Council is here to present this to the board. Okay, thank you, uh, Rick, and um, thanks, President Swan. I'm going to go through this item fairly quickly unless um, there's a desire to spend more time on it. Um, the purpose of this item is to formalize the policy that was approved by motion of the board at the September 17th meeting. Um, where the board decided that customers' August 2020 water bills would be adjusted to reflect their July 2020 billing unless the August 2020 bill is lower. Uh, and of course, that applies to customers um, who are not under the catastrophic loss policy due to unfortunate losses of homes uh, and the like. So, um, Again, the purpose of this is just to formalize and document the reasons for that decision. Um, so I won't rehash some of the reasoning and discussion from the last meeting, except to say um, you have a resolution that tries to you know, thoroughly present the background and the reasons um, that were discussed at the prior meeting. Um, and um, I recommend approval of the resolution um, because this is kind of an unusual measure that's intended to be one time in light of the very particular circumstances of the event. And I think the resolution will help establish, you know, why this was done and what the parameters for it are. Um, I would note, I did catch a typo in the resolution in the fourth whereas paragraph um, there's a word damages, which should be damaged. Um, so following the discussion of the board and the public, um, uh, I just uh, clarify, I, I recommend a motion to approve resolution number four, 2021, with that one modification that the word damages should be damaged. And I'm happy to answer any questions or go, go through it more thoroughly if there's a desire to do that by anyone on the board. Okay, thank you, Gina. Does the board have any questions about this proposed resolution? Bob? That's, excuse me, not so much a question as a, as a comment. Subsequent to our motion uh, last time, there were a number of questions on social media about um, the fact that the folks that were in A do not um, whatever area um, we're saying, why should we be paying anything when we were basically out of water? That is no monthly fee or a prorated portion of the monthly fee as well. And I, I'm assuming that this motion does not um, take that into account. It basically is assuming um, a, a full month, regardless of whether they were in that zone or not. I think the wording in the, in the motion was the fact that if your water bill was was less in the sub, uh, subsequent month than July, you would pay the lesser amount. Yeah, I understand that. So, you know, the, the water bill is comprised of two components. One is a fixed fee. The other is a variable fee. Certainly, if you're not in your house, your variable fee would be less. 
but if you're not able to use the water while you're in your house, the in, in some cases, some utilities, I think mostly private, uh, there's a proration process that you're able to get a credit for the, even the fixed part of the bill in the time that you're not able to use it. We decided not to do that. And I, I just wanted to make sure that that is correct, right, Dina, that it is, there's no no credits in that regard. Right, this this resolution is very straightforward and, and really just parrots um, what the board decided by motion last time. And it does not address that circumstance, which you just described. Bob right. Would, yeah. And I appreciate you putting that line in there about the catastrophic. I think it's important when we make these adjustments that we're clear that it does not impact any other kinds of policies that we uh, have in place for those people that um, tragically lost their houses and are really suffering right now. Okay, thank you, Bob. Lois, you had a question? Well, on the set fee, Normally, if you, let's say um, you decided to go to Timbuktu for three months and we're going to be here, you always have to pay the set fee um, to have, to be part of the water district is what I'm, I'm assuming, maybe I'm wrong, but seems to me that this, I can understand people, their houses burned down or some of what's gone on here can maybe affect the set fee, but normally I wouldn't think the set fee is, is um, changed uh, unless it's some dire circumstances like right now. So, I mean, Rick knows that, but I, I, I'm I just mean, look, we're thinking not that that's, that's the way it is. I mean, this is not here to debate that tonight. What? Because I do have a lot of comments I can make about that, but I don't think we're here to debate that tonight. I okay. think. Well, I, I didn't want to debate it. Actually, I'd like to make a motion to approve number four. Hey, well, hang on, Lois. 2021. Hey, hang on, we're not at that point yet. Um, okay, well, let me do it when it. you get, we get there. It, we'll, we'll let you make a, make a motion. Okay. Uh, so, okay, so I'm sorry, Lois. So do we have any other directors that want to make a comment or ask a question at this time? And if not, we're going to go to the, uh, the public. Do, does the public on the call have any questions or comments regarding this matter? Okay, Joe. Let me start my timer, Joe. Thank you, Mr. President. This is a quickie. I've gotten a few calls about whether or not the district has a, um, a low income or financial hardship category for uh, payment of district water bills. And I don't know the answer to that, uh, but I said I would ask it this evening under this item. Is that something the district has or would consider many utilities do have kind of a threshold level of income after which there's a special um, rate structure for uh, payment of utility costs based on income. Right, we, we, we do have something like that. Yes. Okay, uh, I think it was- so uh, I'd recommend referring to the- a oh, sorry, back. Back. I, I couldn't hear what, what, what the district manager said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Steve, I didn't hear you. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, go, go ahead, Rick. No, uh, have... Joe, I would recommend that they go to our district website. We do have a pilot program for low income. Uh, there's an application, there is still funds available. Um, it's a new pilot program that the board just adopted uh, as a pilot for one year. And all the information on how to apply is on our website. And if the folks are not uh, able to go on the website, they can call our customer service staff and they'll send them the application. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Joe. Any other uh, questions or comments from any of the public? Okay, seeing, seeing none, come back to the board where Lois, you don't even have to raise your hand, Lois. I'm just gonna ask you to go ahead and make a motion. 
Well, thank you so much, Steve Swan. Uh, I'd um, like to make a motion that we approve resolution number four, 20-21. 20 uh, if I could offer, um, I, I'm sorry for this, but uh, if you could include in your motion, Lois, the correction, the word damages should be damaged. Oh, oh yeah, I forgot. <laughs> sorry. I, I heard you say that. Okay. Can I amend my motion to uh, include the word damaged instead of damage? What, where is that? Anyway. Uh, damage versus damages. I think is that's the correct one. Uh, yeah. Damage. I, I had my hand on that and then um, threatened damages it, it should be damage it should like be damage. damaged instead of damages right thank you is it is it damage or damaged damage damaged d, d. 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 that's good i'll second it okay. Okay. okay it's been seconded holly would you like to go ahead and record the vote Director Ferris? Aye. Director Falls? Yes. Director Henry? Yes. Director Moran? Yes. President Swan? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, everybody. Rick? Okay, item uh, 5A is uh, a policy uh, or a political uh, activity during the 2020 election season and we have district council to uh, present this item to the board. Okay, thank you, Rick. Um, and uh, this is a, a little bit of a change of pace from um, the discussion of issues related to the wildfire. Um, but, um, you know, despite the focus on the wildfire, I thought it was important to uh, remind, to provide kind of a reminder for the board and also um, for staff members and senior staff um, regarding uh, ethical rules that apply to public service during election season. I, I mean, they apply all the time, but they're especially important to follow during the election season. Um, so I'm gonna go through some of the, um, the key rules to keep in mind as we go through this election season. Um, and I also want to point out that I'm happy to respond to any specific questions that you may have that aren't addressed by the memo. Um, with the caveat that, of course, I can't provide advice to anybody's, um, for anybody's election or campaign. Um, but what I can do and what I think it's important for me to do as district council is to answer questions about how folks who are currently holding roles um, of public leadership and service, um, how to follow the, uh, or how to comply with the ethical responsibilities of those offices during the election season. Um, so the first important rule to keep in mind that I know you're all um, very familiar with is the uh, central rule against misuse of public funds. Um, the essence of this rule is that no one can use the resources of a California government entity for private purposes, which include advocating regarding election issues. So this, um, the typical examples of this have to do with like a staff member who has a district issued laptop or a cell phone. Um, this pro prohibition prevents folks from using those devices to engage in election or campaign activity. It prevents folks from using um, uh, staff time, for example, while you're on the job with a public agency engaging in election activities. It's um, the basis, it's partly the basis for why I can't answer questions that involve providing advice to an election or campaign. Um, all of those things would constitute an improper uh, use of public funds for private or uh, election campaign purposes. Um, the second rule that I've outlined in the memo has a number of different aspects to it. Um, I've kind of summarized a lot of principles under the heading communications. Um, and this, these rules apply when actually participating in a district function or in an official capacity. So 
Um, for example, the staff members as well as board members have a First Amendment right to engage in political activity as a private citizen. The problems occur is when that type of advocacy overlaps with um, participating in official functions. So when you're actually, you know, sitting on the dais in a board meeting, a recent example would be, you know, board members handing out water at the district. That would be another setting where this type of communication would be prohibited. Um, it also, I mean, just as an example, if somebody calls you to talk to you about board related issues, you know, a member of the public calls you as a board member to talk about board issues, uh, that would not be a good setting to bring up any of the issues that are prohibited, um, that are considered prohibited communication. So th this is just a partial list, but some of the, the key rules are not to refer to a director's position being an elected position or to the election cycle, again, while serving in a, uh, a district function or an official capacity, not to refer to anyone's candidacy or an opponent's candidacy. Um, not to refer to an election campaign, and this includes slogans, wearing campaign buttons, et cetera. You know, so for example, wearing a campaign button while passing out water for the district would be an issue. Uh, not communicating in a manner that expressly advocates the election or defeat of any identified candidate, um, and not to solicit campaign or election related contributions for anyone, uh, including yourself. And you know, there are things that go beyond these prohibited communications that can cause issues in terms of a board's functionality and, and, and uh, governance. And I uh, don't want to get into all the different ways that that kind of thing can manifest. I would just encourage the board during this election season to think about um, how any election activities that you may be participating in could affect your ability to work together um, post-election. So I think it's something worth keeping in mind, but um, also something that's up to each director and in their individual um, discretion. So the third rule against mass mailings, I'm not going to belabor this point um, because uh, I think the key point is that if you're going to send out any mass mailings uh, as a director, or as a district, especially during election season or containing election related messages, um, please clear them through me so that there aren't any problems with FTPC issues. And if it's a campaign related mailing that I can't comment on, I will tell you that, but I'd rather be consulted um, if it's potentially a district issue um, than not. So um, feel free to contact me about any questions or concerns you may have. And if it's something that I can't answer because you know, gets too far into the realm of campaigns or elections, I will, um, I will say that. Um, but I, again, I'd rather be consulted than not if it bears on the district's business and functioning. Um, are there any questions from board members or staff for that matter related to this item? I got a question. Lou has a question. Go ahead, Lou. You're on mute, Lou. Thank you, Steve. Gina, to the extent that you can answer for an incumbent that is running for re-election and either a ratepayer or a group of ratepayers ask, what is your basically platform or stance on, on uh, priorities for the future? What are the, the guide rails around that for you? Um, so you're saying, make sure I understand the question. You're a sitting board member and you've been asked, what is your platform or your stance on some issues um, Correct. for the future? For the future, right. Yeah, I mean, I think the only rule that comes under the rubric of uh, political ethics for sitting board members would be that um, if possible, you want to make it clear that the opinion that you express is your opinion as a private citizen or a candidate and not your op opinion as sort of in your capacity as a board member or in particular that it's not the opinion of the board or other members of the board. So that's the key rule is make it clear that it's your private opinion as a citizen and or a candidate and not a board or district opinion. Okay, thank you. Lois? Hey, thank you. Um, I have a question about mass mailings. You're talking basically about 
mailings that the district puts out or could it concern mailings that candidates put out or maybe um, board members um, who put out mailings. I, I mean, I, I don't quite understand your your mass mailing. Yeah, well, and this is, this is a, a little bit of a confusing one because um, it's not that common for members, I, I think, of a, board members of a water district to engage in these types of mass mailings. Um, whereas, you know, a city council person, for example, may have an office and a staff that routinely communicates with the public on behalf of like a council district or something. And so they, that it becomes a little more critical in those circumstances. They may have letterhead like from the council district. And so then they have to be really careful when they're sending out those kinds of communications during election season. I would frankly be surprised if any director of the district was sending out mass mailings um, that could potentially trigger this rule, but I wanna make you aware of it because if there are questions, I'd, you know, I'd rather be consulted than not. So what if the director's name is on, I um, say, as a supporter or something uh, that a candidate puts out? Well, if it's, if it's coming from a campaign, um, then the campaign should make sure they're following election rules, but it wouldn't trigger the prohibition against mass mailings, which has more to do with mailings that are paid for by the government. So if the okay. district's paying for it, or you know, if you had an office, for example, as a district board member, and the office was paying for it, that's where you could have the problem. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Lois. Any other questions from the, the board? Can, can I just, quick, uh, just a quick comment that, you know, Gina used the example of uh, handing out bottled water and Several of you have done that and, and please we encourage uh, if you would like to donate your time to come down. It's a great way to, to talk to people in the community. Um, and I, you know, please don't stay away. Um, you're more than welcome to come down. We enjoy having board members, no more than two at a time. <laughs> but we do enjoy having you down uh, to solicit water out and we probably won't be doing it too much longer. Um, so. Well, and I apologize if I suggested in any way that that activity is discouraged or, or prohibited. It's um, it's just a question of being conscious of your communications while you're doing it so that you're not tripping over any of these ethics rules. All right. Got it. Thank you. Do, uh, do we have a question here? Cynthia, uh, call in uh, participant. Zenzo, you, your hand is up. Do you have a, a question on this? You're on mute. Okay. I, I just had a comment uh, in response to Joe Kuchara's question about people in financial difficulty now. And I wanted to make the suggestion that Valley Churches is helping people with their water bills. Great. Thank you for sharing that, Cynthia. And we'll make it into the minutes. Okay. Uh, back if there are no other comments from the board, then we can move on. Thank you for that uh, warning, Gina, for uh, making us aware of election laws. Uh, Rick, back to you. Item 5B. Unmute. Okay. Item, uh, item 5B is uh, a memo uh, requesting the cancellation of committee meetings uh, for October um, and uh, public committee member recruitment information for 2021. We are still, staff is still working and getting trained that we're starting up with FEMA now. We have an incredible workload uh, as a result of uh, the wildfire. It would be nice if we could hold off one more month on a heavy committee schedule. Uh, we do think that we're going to need a, a, a finance committee meeting, uh, but we'd like to hold off to bringing back the full schedule of committee meetings to November. Um, and also part of this memo is that 
you know, the year is coming to an end and previous years we found ourselves uh, looking for committee members and recruiting committee members and trying to appoint and taking uh, time. And it was going into February, I think, uh, that where we were still trying to appoint committee members. So we decided that we were trying to get a, a, uh, a jump on it this year and bring to the board to start talking about moving forward. I know it's October, but I can tell you right now, December is going to be here. And what, Holly, our meeting schedule coming up is, what, one meeting a month for the holidays in November, December? Is that correct? Uh, so uh, first off, I, I would like to ask the board if uh, you would allow us to uh, cancel the committees, uh, except for uh, a finance, a special finance committee, and then uh, talk about committees. Okay. Uh, all right, so that's uh, the request in front of us. Uh, Lois, you have your hand up. You must be quick on the draw tonight. I have to be, you know, I'm, I'm getting old, so I got to get ahead of the game. Uh, so I, I understand that our district staff right now is extremely busy and they find themselves very much involved in these committee meetings. And, and it, it seems to me that it, it would be better to wait in, until November. The days are dwindling down, September, November. Anyway, uh, except for a budget and finance committee meeting, I think that has to happen but we need to look at the workload that staff has and realize that they've got some very important things that they're still working on. Yeah, thank you, Lois. I, I tend to agree with you. I think uh, if the staff is making a request like this, it's, it's not capricious. Um, Bob, you have a comment? Yeah, I mean, I think in addition to October, it's very possible it might stretch into November as well, depending on how the workloads are. So I, I think we just need to be, um, you know, prepared for that. Uh, it's been a really tough year for committees, and and certainly this wildfire was just sort of the the last, you know, nail. Um, I, I would certainly encourage everybody sitting on committees now to reapply, um, because you know, they, they kind of didn't get their full uh, time in. So I, I certainly do hope people that are on there now do uh, recommit. And uh, yeah, Rick, thanks very much for bringing it back this early. It absolutely is needed to be done uh, so that we can make sure that um, hopefully we can appoint committees at the organizing meeting um, in, in December so that everybody can be uh, hitting the ground running come January. And hopefully 2021 will be a better year for all of us. And we'll get the folks who want to rebuild on the path to rebuilding as quickly as possible. Thank you, Bob. Um, Rick, Moran? Uh, I, I respect the staff's uh, workload here and reprioritizing committee meetings uh, is well you know, we don't need to do that. Uh, and I respect the work that uh, the staff is doing. Thank you, Rick. Any other comments, questions from the board? If not, public, any questions or comments from you? Okay, back to the board, no questions from the public. So, um, and, and, you know, just, uh, if we do need to come back to committee, you know, we'll still have a full workload on our capital improvement projects. The Lumpico tanks are moving full speed ahead. We're, we're starting to uh, get ready to disinfect and bring the new tanks online. That construction project is going full speed. The uh, pipeline projects north of town and California Drive will be coming up soon. They're, they're a little off schedule because of the fire. And then we're gonna be needing to get to committees, uh, especially environmental and engineering on the you know, the, the watershed damage and the, uh, the talk about uh, the types of pipes and, and, and final repairs. A lot of this will start in committees and wind up to the, to the full board. 
but we're gonna need committees, there's no doubt, um, probably sooner than later as we start getting into this uh, engineering and get into this environmental. We still have uh, the uh, swim tank uh, we'll be bringing to the board here very shortly uh, on the environmental review. And then we have other environmental reviews to come up on a couple other tank projects that, you know, as part of, we just can't stop doing our normal work. We have a heavy capital improvement project load that we must keep going. At the same time, we must start addressing uh, fire repairs. So it's going to be busy, there's no doubt. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Lou, you have a comment and question. I have a question for Gina. Do we need a formal resolution to cancel the committee meetings for the month of October or as a voice vote uh, adequate? Uh, a voice vote would be more than sufficient for this purpose. Um, I mean, a, a motion. Do we even need to do that? No, I think if the, if the board is uh, unanimously directing staff to cancel the committee meetings, that's sufficient. We've done that in the past. Yeah, uh, so I, I don't have an issue with uh, with canceling any committee meetings during October. Anybody else? Everybody in favor? Why? We're good. Okay, I think we're good. Okay, thank you. So there you have it, Rick. Uh, now step two, you wanted to, did you want to go ahead and have everybody agree with the suggestion to go ahead and send out the uh, the uh, notice that we're accepting applications for the 2021 committee member? Right, I'd, I'd like to get some direction to kick that off. And, and I do believe, uh, agree, uh, the district secretary, you know, she, she was strong on talking about, you know, carrying over some of these committee members or at least in, to make sure we invite these people to carry over. Um, you know, it's a lot of work going out and, and advertising and filling committees, uh, but I, I do want to get the board's input on, on moving ahead uh, and how you would like to, if anything different from our normal procedures, or uh, just go ahead and, and start their uh, start the process. Uh, I, I don't know if that would, we have any, I, I don't have any specific direction other than to go ahead and initiate the process. Uh, I think Bob said it very well with the, and it, you know, a message to those current committee members to please reapply so right. that they can be considered uh, so that we don't have a hole in, uh, in the area. But uh, And I would like to bring back, uh, I wasn't prepared tonight, but bring back for the uh, facilities committee on the building you know, that committee barely even got to meet with COVID and then the fire. Uh, it was, a, I think that had a sunset, that committee, but I, I need to research that a little better. Uh, yeah. I'd like to bring that back and, and definitely invite those people because that's a, you know, all the committees are great, but that committee was really had a lot of good uh, experience and long-term residency of the Valley and, and, and uh, under, kind of understood the district's needs and we just didn't just didn't get into it. We we were interrupted, and I'd like to see that committee uh, reestablished and and continue again. Sure, well, that's good. Any uh, other comments on the directions? Oh, well, I think Holly had something to say. Yeah, oh, and then Holly. Um, hi, I was just going to um, suggest that perhaps <laughs> instead of going out and um, recruiting public more public members if you would consider just simply rolling it over with the if if the public members that are still on net, that are on there now would like to just just not go through the whole process and just um, have these people go for 2021 since they most have only had two meetings this year hmm. That sounds like a Gina question, uh, if we can do that without uh, stepping on our toes. Uh, is that something we could do, Gina? Invite people, but also make mention that there are committees that will be starting up again and invite people to, I don't know, do we invite them to join if we get a, a group of the existing committee members that want to retain their spots in the existing committees? 
This is certainly within the board's power. I'm depending exactly what the board wanted to do would affect how, you know, it got documented. If it's a significant deviation from the board policy manual, I would recommend a resolution. If it's very minor um, adjustment, you know, motion is probably fine. Okay. Um, we have a couple of questions from or comments from board members. Rick Moran? Yeah. Um, well, I, I support doing both. Um, and I think uh, if people are willing and able to uh, be on committees, this is going to be a challenging next few months here, next year. Uh, interesting things are going to be happening. Uh, there's a lot of public interest in uh, this water district. So I, I don't think it would be too difficult to recruit some new members. But we also should encourage those members that are already here to continue to be on the committees. And the one thing I liked about the formation of the committees uh, in recent years is we've increased the number. So I don't see anything wrong with doing both, encouraging the people that were uh, on committees to stay and to also encourage new people to join. Okay, great. Bob, you're, uh, you're, you're next. Yeah, I, I agree with Rick. I think that's really the best way to go in, in the interests of, you know, continuing to um, do outreach into the community to get um, new uh, faces, new ideas, new perspectives onto the committee. I think we need to open it up for people to apply. But I, I do say that the people that were on the committees this last year um, you know, I would very much like them to, to reapply and um, that would certainly, in my mind anyway, give uh, a lot of consideration for that. So um, I think Rick's spot on, let's, let's do both. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Lou, you have uh, your hand up. Yeah, I just wanna add my voice to what Holly said and uh, Rick Moran said and Bob as well said that uh, a combination of of both of those would, would be a great idea, both encouraging people to participate, but also making sure we keep those members that we already have. Thank you, Lou. Lois? I agree with the last uh, three board members who spoke. So I, I go along with doing both things. Okay. Uh, Holly? Is that what you wanted to hear? Or is that something in addition to what you wanted to hear? Um, it's up to the board. So if, if I understand that right, we're going to go out, advertise and send, uh, uh, send out notices to the existing committee members, encouraging them to reapply. Right. Because some of those committees, I think uh, they had sunsets and so forth. We'll have to take a look but we'll just encourage everybody to apply. You have some people on committees that are running for office that, so things may change no matter what. Um, so we will do that. We will we'll do advertisements and we will ask people that are already existing on committees to, if they would wish to reapply. That's what Perfect. I think I heard. And Perfect. Uh, Rick, we may need to specifically look at the facilities committee. You raise a good point about it being differently constituted. I don't think it turns over at the end of the year the way the other ones do. They it just did, need to it, be extended. It did have a sunset on it, though, Gina. I don't yeah. know that it's the end of the year, but it might be like February or something. Right. Like that. That's what I believe to be the case. And I don't think there's a limit to, you know, if you are on a committee that you can't re up. I think that's up to the board. Uh, there is no limit in the board yeah, policy no limit, uh, on that. I think that's all up to the board. So it should be pretty easy right. to do to right. facilitate this. Lou, you have your hand up for another comment? Yes. Um, Gina, if I heard you correctly, it, it sounds like you believe we need a uh, resolution from the board <laughs> to do this. Is that correct? Uh, no, I, I, and maybe I, I may have been confusing two things, the um, ad hoc committee regarding facilities and the regular committees. Um, I, I don't think any action is needed by the board to uh, provide direction to encourage existing committee members to reapply while soliciting uh, new applicants as well. I think that's consistent with the existing processes, um, but we do need to take a look at uh, the resolution that formed and constituted the ad hoc 
facilities committee because I believe it sunsets in, uh, like you said, Bob, like February or March or something. Yeah. So um, it's not going to automatically get new members, but it may need to be extended or something. Or, but that will require resolution to, to change how it how it functions and what its term is, but not thank urgent. You. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we got some public here. Any comments, questions or so from the, understand sort of the direction we're heading. Any public comment? Seeing none. Okay, we're back. So moving along, item six, the consent agenda. Uh, minutes from the last meeting to be added in. Any, anybody have a problem with that? No? Okay. Uh, and then we have written communication in the packet, informational material adjournment is coming up right now. So unless there is anything else anyone wants to bring up right now, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much for your participation and especially to the attendees. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great night. Well, have a good night. night. Thanks.